that case, I won't. Great. All right, so it's September 26, 2016, and I am sitting in downtown Washington at the Port of Washington, mm. historic Port of Washington Museum with Mr. Blunt Rumley. Yep. So thank you, Blunt, for agreeing to this interview today. Um, so to start off, this is, of course, for the Port Light Project about historical maritime transportation in North Carolina, especially from the Outer Banks to ports like Washington. Mm -hmm. So can you tell me a little bit about your background? Are you from Little Washington? I was born here on November 25th, 1941. And uh, I was in the auto parts business for some time and uh, sold my business. It looked like somebody else needed to own that rather than me, which I was happy to sell it. And uh, so I bailed out of that. Uh, part of my life and sold it to a fellow from Bayboro and uh, freed me up. And about that time they were building the estuarium. Mm -hmm. And so I applied and luckily beat out a number of other folks for the uh, administrator's job, which became the manager. And uh, I was there for 17 and a half years. Wow. Saw it from the onset, helped get it going. And yeah. a lot of people did, but I was just one segment of it. And I retired a year and a half ago, December 31st, 2014. And um, so, and I've been, didn't really want to do anything, but I've always been interested in history and maritime things and wanted to preserve all I could of that, just like you are. And uh, I found myself in the middle of a, a lot of, uh, historical things that are going on would just fill in, like B. Morton over here, that uh, lady died, and who was keeper of all the foul artifacts from the foul fleet of ships. And so I am extracting things from her house. Oh. I've gained the trust of, I uh, hope I'm worthy of it, of uh, John Fowl Morton, her brother, who is handling her estate. So I'm, uh, he gave me permission to go in on here and there, and, remove things like that. It's very exciting. So I'm working on that. I'm in the Maritime History Council and uh, I am on another project. James Henry Baum, who was a, a pilot in the Lafayette Flying Corps before the United States really got into World War I. And we're having a, a exhibit on him on November 11th, Veterans Day, the Turnage Theater, and I've got all the artifacts. So I can't help it but be the one to build that exhibit. So I'm working on that too. That's and great. I have a number of things going on right now. So well, this, I'll do it at the same time, it seems like. so. This area is lucky so. to have you and lucky that you're retired and free and full of energy <laughs> and interest. So, yeah, it's fun. So um, when I say Little Washington, is that okay? Or Yeah. Because well, I, historically, I'm, people have called it Little Washington, but... Uh, a lot of people call it, you know, the original Washington. Well, historically, we we like to call it the original Washington, mm -hmm. we, but uh, other people call it Little Washington, and to dis uh, distinguish us, you know, from D.C. But the local uh, Chamber of Commerce and the tourism folks decided if other people wanted to call it Little Washington, that's okay with us because it makes it sound quaint and good and it's an attraction to be called Little Washington. Okay. So what the heck, you know, let it go and <laughs> it sounds good and helps the economy, so All right. let it be. So was your, were your parents from here? Yeah. What, mm -hmm. did, what did they do for a living? Uh, my father grew up on a farm, the Rumley Farm, on the other side of the river from here, from uh, Highway 17 East to Whitchard's Beach, a peninsula that went between Chocolate Bay and Pamlico River just several miles down. And lost it all in the Depression. And my father and his uncle, uh, Otway Rumley, who was named incidentally for Otway Burns. Down there, you know Otway. So. I do. Anyway, so I've had a couple, a couple of Ot Rumleys. That one was like 1700 sometime named for Otway Burns and then my great uncle. Anyway, the two of them uh, had this farm together and they had uh, 
other businesses related to the farm, Rumley Farm meat products and you know, that kind of thing. They had some barges that they hauled cattle back and forth in. And uh, anyway, my uncle, Daddy said, uh, endorsed too many notes of other people and here came the depression. It, a lot of obligations, financial obligations of other people and he gave no thought to you know, being able to pay it back and other folks paying it back. Depression came, all those notes came due and he lost the farm because of it. So uh, then daddy got into the auto parts business which is where I landed okay. after a while. And uh, so that yeah. is the way it is now. My mother uh, grew up here too. The, the Baum family, Baum, V-A-U-G-H-A-M was my grandmother and they all came down from uh, northeastern part of the state, related to the BAUMs, Nags Head. Uh -huh. So I'm in that family too. And at some point the BAUMs, one branch of them split off and became V-A-U-G-H-A-M. They changed the name a little bit so it wouldn't sound so Germanic. You know, this was a long time ago and they might have had some you know, political situations to deal with. So it, they uh, renamed themselves V-A-U-G-H-A-M to make it sound a little bit better. And I see McMullins came from Hertford County, Hertford Edenton. Uh, Jeremiah McMullen was a great grandfather and he was a uh, Methodist circuit minister in southeastern Virginia and came down here. And my grandfather, they all got into the legal business. My grandfather was Attorney General, Harry McMullen was Attorney General of the state for a long time. 1930s, 40s, 50s, and how about that? So, uh, and then your middle name is Baum. I mean, Blunt. Blunt. I'm sorry. Yeah. Your middle uh -huh. name is Blunt, but that's also a surname, isn't it? It is. Because yeah. we have some some Blunt history down our way, Adams Creek area. Yeah. Well, that's the same. There was John Gray and William and Thomas Blunt. A lot of them. Yeah, John Gray. They, they were all brothers. You know, a group of uh, brothers. Yeah. So I, I was descended from his brother, William, who was at one point governor of Tennessee, and he had an interesting life, too. And so, anyhow. Wow. Okay, well. So that's, you have I have some roots. roots. See, I'm, I'm stuck down there, I suppose. I got. <laughs> this is great. So where did you go to school, Blunt? NC State, after a while, and Camel, and I didn't, I just, I goofed off too much, and so I, I did not graduate, but I... Enjoyed life too much, I think. Then, so <laughs> well, I ended up. And when you worked at the estuary, the Navy for a while. It was. Did you have an interest in ecology of the area, or was the estuary? Yeah, yeah it, was it was mostly ecology. It, it yeah, is mostly ecology, the, right? Yeah. yeah, and science in general, and in history is a mix. And I don't know. Just my grandfather instilled a lot of history in me, and I, when we used to, my granddaddy would take me, I don't remember my grandfather on my father's side, he died before I was born, but uh, my grandfather on my mother's side would take me, everywhere he'd take me, I would learn a little bit of history. The, I, do you ever, have you ever heard of the Carol Deering ghost ship of Diamond Shoals? Well, he interviewed one of the crewmen on that vessel, and I, he took me with him, and I have a piece of that ship in my attic, I mean, just a piece of wood, but it came off of it. But. Uh, Fascinating. But that was one of the things, and uh, there was another fellow who used to live at Hatter at Buxton named Ben Dixon McNeil, and I don't know. And we used to go see Ben Dixon. My grandfather would take me up the hill, and we'd visit Ben Dixon. And I remember some old either Remington or Royal Manual typewriter he had, and he'd go up, and, you know, walk up the sand path to Ben Dixon O'Neill's house with a whalebone fence, and he'd talk and I, that kind of thing. And I, we'd go visit people. And it wasn't all that important then, but the older I got, the more important it became, and the more it, all that history was part of me. Oh, absolutely. And I just can't get away from it, so I'm very interested in all that, and that was a big reason, I think. And the stories are so important, you heard them. Yeah. So, what was your grandfather's name that would take you around? Harry, Harry McMullen. Harry Mac McMullen. No middle name. Okay. Harry McMullen. Yeah. So, you M C M U L L A N. There uh -huh. is a street in Avon, McMullen Drive, a lane, a road, or something like that, but it's spelled wrong. It's M C M U L L E N at Avon because they always call him Mr. McMullen. 
and we never bothered to correct him. It just, you know, that was okay too. So. How did he have those connections out there? My, that's another really long story, and I, I have written it all down. I don't have it so long, but my grandmother, who there were four children in my grandmother's family, and they were all trying to get through UNC at Chapel Hill during the Depression. My grandfather was the Attorney General, and he was working in Raleigh. And uh, three children were in school at Chapel Hill, and one, the youngest, was at Chapel Hill High School at the time, and my grandmother's friends up there all got together, and they would take trips various places around the state. Just a fun thing to do. And when my grandmother's turn came, she decided that they needed to come east. And none of them had been to Harris Island, really, at the time. And so they decided they'd go down, you know, go down there and explore and see what was there. And they got on a boat. And it seems like every time you get on a boat to go down there, the, the weather's always rough and everybody ends up getting sick and nobody wants to go back. And, you know, some of the foreigners, I'll, to quote that, just don't enjoy that and don't ever go back to visit that much. But anyway, they, uh, they went down and uh, took a, I think it was a, I can't remember, it was from Englehard, might have taken a boat from Englehard or it could have been from Nags Head area. Anyway, Manio, but I think it was Englehard. But they, they went down and uh, had to be Englehard because they drove up to up to Avon, up that way. They were heading for Avon for whatever reason. And the weather was horrible, and they spent the night at Hatteras, Englehart at Hatteras, and then followed. I can't remember whether they, I think maybe they took a bus up there, and the bus was like an old school activity bus, just an old broken down bus, and the, there was a boy who sat on a fish box with a cushion on it, he didn't, nobody had to have a driver's license there then. It just, if you could drive, that was good enough. And the little boy would just, you know, he navigated around ponds of water and it was, you know, high, high water around there during the, it had us and they got around that and went through a lot of deep sand and he finally got them to, late in the day, got them to Avon and it was late in the afternoon, they had to spend the night and somebody let them have a room in their house, so. And that afternoon, my grandmother went and decided she would explore before the sun went down and found this house over on the sound side. And it was boarded up and nobody knew. It, anyway, it seems, I could read all this to you. I got it written down, which is maybe better than me talking. But. No, no, I like you talking. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, so from, this is memory again, which is not infallible, but. She asked who owned the house. You know, she just, you know, what was it? It's kind of a mysterious looking thing. There's some boards over it and abandoned apparently. And she found a fellow named uh, Gib Gray. He ran a general store down there. And I think there may be his son or grandson, somebody named Gib at the time. I don't know whether that, does that ring a bell with mm -hmm. you? Mm -hmm. Okay, this was the original Gib. I think that was one of the biggest stores in Avon, or the most active stores. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What? Give, Store Gib. Gib was, out here. Gib was yeah. about a block from us. There were no blocks, but yeah. Yeah, about that much. We'd always walk up to Gib Store. I spent a lot of time at Gib Store. And uh, incidentally, branching off, Gib uh, sold paint, which I think about the only color was white. <laughs> he had shirts and the only color was white. And dungarees, <laughs> not blue jeans, but dungarees and you know, basic hardware and Whatever. Then he had a little bit of ice cream and you know some canned groceries and things like that. Yeah. So uh, that's what I remember. That he had a his telephone in the town of Avon. The Coast Guard maintained phone was in his in a back room in the store. Wow. So. So y your grandmother found this boarded up. She house? found this house. And asked Gib about it. And it seems that Gib was a caretaker. It belonged to a family from Philadelphia. They came down, it was a, and the man, a fellow, fairly well-to-do family in Philadelphia. I do not know the names, but anyway, the, uh, it was a hunting lodge. I think it was, I think it was 20, roughly 25 acres on the sound side. And it was just north of, no, it was on the south side of the harbor, on the sound side, subdivision now. The house burned down later, but uh, 
anyway, they uh, went down and asked Gib about it. It seems that this fellow who owned the house uh, had a off season. They only went down during the winter time, during hunting season. He entertained maybe business clients down there, something like that. But when the rest of the folks weren't down there, he came, went down there with a lady who it turns out was not his wife. And she apparently was very well off in one of the old families of Philadelphia, I understand. And she had, and the, and the villagers never didn't quite know what to make of her because they'd always walk around the village of Avon late afternoons. And she had a mink coat, a different one for every day of the week. <laughs> Floor length, practically, mink coat. And she had all sorts of things like that. So anyway, they'd go, they'd go walking. And uh, Anyway, at one point, the fellow uh, apparently had a heart attack, stroke, something very serious. And she arranged to get the fellow off the island quickly, tried to. And the man died before they could ever get him back to, as far as Manio, you know, they were trying to get up to Manio. Somewhere they could find a doctor or a hospital or anything kin to medical help, because there wasn't anything in Avon like that. So uh, here she was with a dead, they thought husband maybe, but he wasn't. And she had, it, it fell on her to dispose of the property, the house. And she had, uh, well, he was talking to her fellow's lawyers in Philadelphia, and they decided the best thing to do was probably get rid of the stuff, and so that way none of her friends would know what she had been up to down there, and just it would be gone. It would just be it'd just disappear. That's how it was. Anyhow, they uh, negotiated. My grandfather negotiated with the lawyers in Philadelphia, and they had no idea what it was worth, and they hadn't seen it. So they decided to have two of their law partners to go down, younger members of their law firm, to go down and evaluate the property. And they got as far, I think they took a train from Philadelphia to Norfolk and probably to Elizabeth City. And then the, this was 1932, probably, I think, 31, 32. And, you know, a boat to Mandio, and the weather was awful between Elizabeth City and Mandio, and I think they were seasick, and they decided, you know, they were trying to get to, you know, Hatteras Island, and there was a fellow had a little bit of a ferry he'd run across, I don't know whether it was Toby Tillett, is that name? To yes. It might have been Toby I, yes. at the time. Uh -huh. Anyhow, I'm not sure Toby was even running it, and he might have been. I think so. Maybe he was. Yeah. So, they uh, wanted to get down there. Anyway, the, and the weather was so bad and the insects were so bad, all the yellow flies and green flies and bugs and mosquitoes and everything there was descended on them and the weather was horrible and it just, it was so bad that they decided this was, that was the dropping off place of the earth and no living person would ever want to go down there to that place and it was horrible. It was the worst place they'd ever heard of. They'd never been outside of Philadelphia and it was primitive and it was just overrun with every petulance, everything there ever was, it was bad. That part of the Outer Banks contained it, and nobody should go down there ever again. Anyway, so they turned around and went back and made a report that it was the worst place on earth, and they weren't going there. They never got as far as Oregon Inlet, I don't think. They tried and turned around and said, that's, that's it. So uh, the law firm still was left with the task of getting a valuation on the property, and so they wrote Gib Gray, and Gib had never been off the island, and Gib didn't know what anything was worth, understandably. Yeah. That's not casting anything off on Gib. Mm. Gib, I, Gib was a fine fella, but he just didn't know, you know, the value of things that they had down there, and that was a, it included that was, old mission furniture was in there, and artifacts, and every kind you can think of, pieces of lighthouses, and it, it was like a museum in the house. And it had a little library off to the side and glass on all on three sides of it. And uh, kerosene burning stove and those kinds of things. Great big concrete systems. And, and there was a huge cabinet in there, a big uh, armoire or something like that, that uh, was, must have been very valuable. It was built in Italy during the Renaissance, we later found out. 
things like that in the house, extremely valuable things. Well, Gib had no idea of the value of it, understandably. So he decided it wasn't worth anything. So the lawyers, as Gib said, that was this, this big thing. He said it, it was, who knows what it was worth, but he said he wouldn't give it. It was the ugliest thing he'd ever seen. He wouldn't give a nickel for it, but you might put $5 on it. So <laughs> anyway, that, that kind of valuation. And so they came to an agreement. The lawyers said that, uh, what's he got it for? I'm trying to think what the, the value was going to be. They, they thought maybe $10,000 or something like that for all that property. And that included, uh, there's a house, which two-story house and had, I've forgotten how many, several outbuildings. There was a, a Delco house that had its own generator. Oh, yeah. And a two-holer outhouse and a utility building and a guest house. And all the rooms had fireplaces or at least flues for wood stoves in them, including the guest house. So $10,000, I think, might have been the price. But anyway, my grandfather said there was no way, and he told my grandmother, Patty, I said, Patty says, you know, got these children in school and it's during the Depression and he was not, he was not making but 5000 maybe it was $5,000 offer they did it for us. That might have been it. But he said, there's no way we can do that. That don't make but $5,000 a year. You know, how are we going to afford this? And she said, Harry said, we just got to make it. You know, these people have gone to all that trouble and she just had to have that place anyway. And she had her mind set on something. You couldn't let her, that just would never go away. She was a very strong lady. So... Uh, my grandfather, she said, well, God offered him something. So, and so the people proposed $1,000. I think he said he couldn't even afford $1,000. She said, Harry, get, offer him something, do something. So he said, all right. So he made an offer, I think it was $500. They said sold. <laughs> so, because they wanted, all they wanted to do was dump it. They had yeah. to get rid of that property. And $500 was a big loss. And the lady, I think, came down. She did want some of the silverware. She left everything just like it was when, you know, they, she got this fellow off the island and left in great haste with everything else that was there. And so she had some valuable things down there, and she wanted to pull those off. But the furniture stayed. Oops. Um, okay, let me fix that. Did he, um, let's see. Oops, see, sorry, I just popped it right I'll off. I'll get you an email address, too, by the way. I, I yeah, can, yeah, yeah. I've got it written up and I can tell you. This is a great story. I can tell I'm you. like hearing it from the horse's mouth. Right. Well, I might have my numbers wrong and that it's kind all of right. thing. It's so. um, Did he die on Harris? The, the, the Philadelphia owner, the owner? Yeah. Yeah, he... He died well, he, right? No, I think he died on the boat on the way to Nags Head. He was just about gone. He had a heart attack probably and... And they tried to get him off the island, and he died before they could ever get him as far as Manio. So then that house, that hunting lodge, and all those acres came into your family. Yeah. Guys. And so did you grow up going there regularly? Yeah, we went down the summers all the time. we go down there. And <laughs> did they get that before you were born? Yeah. I was born in 1941. They bought the house in 32. So I came along, and they'd spend, my grandmother would spend a lot, a lot of time during the summertime. We didn't go down in the wintertime. We boarded up. And we had a, a system, rainwater off the roof, you know, with all the cedar shingle roof. And yeah. drank. that was my first experience with rainwater. And it tasted a little bit different and it was very soft. I never felt like I could wash myself and be clean. It felt so slick. <laughs> and What did you think about those Avon people when you went? Well, they, they were our friends. We had them, you know, it was a very close knit group and they accepted us as one of them. Yeah, it, that's how it was. And like I said, the northern and the southern parts of Avon didn't associate with each other that much. And I'd go down and uh, I'd get haircuts on Gib Gray's back porch in his store with one of those manual haircut shears that you'd squeeze. And I think I yanked out more hair than it cut, but it was say, dull, too dull for me. But, uh, but my grandfather, one of the best things he liked, all the stresses of Raleigh and dealing with everything that he had to deal with, all the legal stuff in Raleigh, it was a huge stress. This was during Governor Scott, Greg Cherry, Erringhouse, who else was it? You know, that 
era, 1930s, 40s, 50s yeah. time. And he helped do a lot of planning for the state. And Brown versus the Board of Education, he wrote the uh, opinion, the state opinion for that for the Supreme Court, one of the things he did. Anyhow, a lot of stress. So he'd go down to Avon, and my grandfather would have more fun, enjoyment, talking to the people of Avon. He'd go give Gray's store and sit down and talk with them. And that was his de-stress time. And they enjoyed talking to him a whole lot, and he had a good time with them. And I'd go down, and one of the big things, I'd go down, and uh, my grandfather liked, he'd just paint the house. That's just another stress reliever. <laughs> and I'd go down the house, and there's one room I just remember the smell of leaded paint, old-time leaded paint. He'd paint the house every time I'd go down there, he was painting, I think. Hmm. He liked to do that. And uh, I'd go up in the upstairs, which was not insulated, up, had a couple of bedrooms upstairs. And another thing I remember was the wind from the sound whistling through the screens. You know, every, every, just I, that would put me to sleep every night listening to the wind going through the screen wire. And cedar shingle smell in the attic up there too. That was my place. And the dark parts of the attic and would it was fearsome when I was little. It was always stayed that yeah, dark, and I couldn't. I was afraid of going back in the bowels of the house. I didn't know what I'd find back there. But the but the smells and the the sounds. That's so nice. That's the, <clears throat> How long did the house stay in your family? From the time we bought it, which was I think thirty one or thirty two, until the time we sold it in I think nineteen sixty five or six, somewhere around there. And it was a wonderful place to go. We had my grandfather would take me out in the sound, and we he'd have a wash small wash tub tied to his belt and we'd go clamming and uh and tell stories the whole way and so that and all was the, and all the seaweed that washed up on the shore and the horseshoe crabs that washed up and lots of those out down the sound at that time and so that explains how your grandfather had those connections out at the outer banks and he would take you around yeah. to meet mr and ben. we visited everybody ben dixon mcneil and, and that was on portsmouth right Ben Dixon was on at Buxton. Oh, he was in Buxton? Okay. Yeah. Okay. I mean, he probably traveled around a little bit, but his house was up in the Buxton Woods, up at, oh. up close to the lighthouse. And then we went up there, too, during... This was the time uh, Cape Harris Lighthouse was inactivated. I think World War II came along, and they, it was of use to the German submarines, you know, the U-boats, so they cut out the lighthouse. And then they had a temporary steel tower up there, which maybe knew about that too. Oh yes, I do remember At the time. About that. Well, that was in the forties, I think then. Yeah. And my father and I we would climb Cape Harris Lighthouse and there were no park service people or anything. It was totally vacant. The door was open and people had shot out a lot of the prisms in the in the light. And there's a lot of glass up there. And I remember I was afraid of cutting my feet going up there. How about that? But that was awful that they'd cut out some of those, you know, Fresnel lenses on that, that light, but they did. Yeah. I don't know who they is, but... Did you ever go to people. Ocracoke? Yeah, yeah. We'd, when we went to Avon, we didn't generally go to Ocracoke. We would we would go to Avon. We'd go for most of the time going to Avon. We drove around some of the time, and we had to cross all, like four ferries on the way over there. There's Alligator River, and... Was it Roanoke Sound? This is was? from Little Washington. Yeah, we'd from go Washington. We go. On over. We'd go to Englehard and then go on. We didn't take Highway 64. That was a little bit longer. We take the the road through Hyde County and into Dare, via Englehard and and then go everywhere. I think Roanoke Sound was the only one that just had a bridge across. I think Croatan Sound did not. So there was a ferry there, and then Mans Harbor ferry there. Oregon and it ferry there. So it was an all day thing to get to Avon. When it was, we'd start out early in the morning. Uh, we'd have an old, I think a Dodge car one time and then a, a Plymouth another time, I don't know, you know, a couple of old cars and Chevrolet. And I always have to let the air out of the tires to get across. And the ferries, of course, there were no ferry landings. And they were just old wooden ferries. I guess Toby Tillett was one of the ferry people. And we just we'd have to wait, and the people would queue up on the sand somewhere, and they had an idea where he might beach it, but you weren't really sure. 
you'd have to wait till you put like a Navy landing craft after he dropped the ramp and then you drove on. And if you went on uh, in forward, you'd have to back off and vice versa. So uh, that's how we'd, we'd get to Avon. Then you'd have to, if we were lucky, the tide was down and we'd ride the beach and we could make a lot better time that way. If we weren't so lucky, the tide was up, we'd have to go the sand route, deep sand, and we'd get stuck and you'd have to scoop up. Then the, the radiator would boil over a lot of times and you'd have to uh, go find some fresh water. Hopefully you'd find some fresh water in a rainwater pond somewhere you could feed the radiator a little bit. And if you're smart, you carry a little water with you just for that purpose. And after World War II, uh, my first memories were maybe 1944, 45, something about the end of World War II. Mm -hmm. And we had, uh, over some of the sand dunes going down, we had the Navy or the uh, military landing strip mats. Oh, yeah. Had sections of landing, you know, perforated steel landing strip mats that would interlock. And they would be uh, placed over these dunes so that you could get over a sand hill and back down on the other side. You could drive on those mats? You could drive on the mats, and that would... That would get us over the, over some dune where the little sand path would get us down the island. Okay. But where we had to cross over a dune of some kind, you know, some little rise in the sand, uh, it was hard to get across in a two-wheel drive vehicle. So we had to, so they, they being, I don't know who they was, maybe the state or somebody had placed landing strip mats uh. over those things and we'd get out and get us down there. and. Uh, and then, I said it was an all-day trip, and then a couple of other times, I remember, but they'd take them to the, uh, go to Englehard, and the freight boat there, which was very much like the Bessie, Virginia, here, uh, and that was the Hadeco, H-A-D-E-C-O, Hatteras Development Company. And we'd leave, we'd drive to Englehard, get there before dawn, and have breakfast in the dark at Englehard Cafe. And that was right on the edge of Far Creek at Englehard. And then we'd, we'd load to take planks and put her over on the deck. And then we'd load the, the car. And later on, 1949, Daddy got a Jeep, old Willis Jeep, a four-cylinder flathead. And we would uh, put the automobile or Jeep, whatever, uh, on the Hattico. <laughs> and we rock and roll across the sound of Englehart, and I think it was probably Odin's dock was where we docked, and put some more boards out and back her off at Odin's dock. Wow, and so head you remember the Hattico, so, yeah. riding on the Hattico. What's that? You remember that? Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, we, I got seasick a few times on that too. <laughs> First time I ever got seasick was on the Hattico, going across. So Everybody's seasick. That was, you, know, you had to get seasick, and you had to be bitten by every bug there was in the earth. That was part of the process of going down there. You knew you were going to go through hard times before you ever got to the destination. A rite of passage. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, they must have kept a bucket on board. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, was the Bessie, Virginia before your time? Mm -mm. I rode to Bessie, Virginia a few times too. You did? From here to where? Yeah. Uh, the Bessie, Virginia, and I've got some reminiscences of the Bessie, Virginia. Yeah. I have written down some of these things. Um, anyway, that's yeah, some thanks. stuff there. Yeah, thanks. Cool. But I'm, I'm working on that. But tell me, about, tell me about anyway, the Bessie, Virginia. Okay, the Bessie, Virginia. Well, I'll start with I'll start with something that I don't have no Just memory. I'm, I'm keep pulling that off. Then. No, no, you're good. I get excited in my hands. I can't talk without moving my hands. <laughs> That's all right. So, uh, the Bessie, Virginia, was preceded since the 1930s, I guess. The uh, Russell L was one. Does that ring a bell at all? Uh, yeah, I remember okay, that seeing Salem. that name. All right, and. And then the Russell L at some point was followed by the Dryden, D R Y D E N. I've heard of the Dryden. Another. And the Dryden was built like the Bessie, Virginia. It was an oyster boat or something that came from Chesapeake Bay. Bessie, Virginia was 95 feet long, I think. And I've got some specs on the Bessie, Virginia that I wrote down, and Van Henry O'Neill, who was the captain of the Bessie, Virginia, told me that personally, and I wrote it down. 
So wow. that's why I got that from the horse's mouth. But that's, anyway, that's great. It was she was built in Crisfield, Maryland, about 1910, 64 feet, 11 inches length overall, with an 18 foot beam, five foot draft, cruising speed 10 knots. <laughs> so, and Van Henry at my father's store, and he'd go hang out at our store, the auto parts store. But I'll get into all that, you know, that link a little bit later. But uh, she was built of California red heart pine and had three inch thick planking on it. And uh, he had a Cummings diesel when he bought her and he later replaced it with a gray marine diesel in Swan Quarter. And he bought it in 1949 or 1950. And Van, that was Van Henry and his father, Walter C. O'Neill. That was, are you familiar with Walter C. and Cap Mike and, Cap and Jesse Garris and some of that crowd down there. But anyway, Van Henry and Walter, his daddy bought it together and the first mate was Powers Garish. And so Powers was Van Henry's brother-in-law, I think. That was Bertha O'Neill was, who lives, he just died a few years ago. Uh, her brother was Powers. Huh. Uh, and he carried all the passengers and freight from here to Ocracoke. It's a very close connection between Ocracoke and Washington. So can I just interrupt for a second? Mm -hmm. Was the Bessie O'Neill based in Ocracoke or yeah. Washington? Yeah, it was best, yeah. based, based in, in Ocracoke. Okay, because I, I assumed as such with the, the captains and all, they're all from Ocracoke. Yeah, all of them from Ocracoke. Yeah. And he'd come up here once a week and he would, there's a lot of commerce. Washington was one of the, you know, the primary sources of everything you could get at Ocracoke. It may not have been the only one, but it was a major source and, and our, the stores like um, there was Thomas and Howard, a wholesale grocer here in town, dealt with the merchants at Ocracoke. Uh, Mayola Ice Cream Company was another one, right? What's left of that building, you can see right around the corner here. Hmm. And let's see, Coca-Cola was another one um, in various dry goods stores and hardware. Harris Hardware was another one that they all bought things from here, and Van Henry would load it. It would go off to Ocracoke. Oh, yeah, uh, fuel was another one. And our Bessie, Virginia had, I remember seeing that around the pilot house were 55-gallon drums of kerosene, diesel fuel, a little bit of gasoline, whatever. Yeah. I've seen it, it bottled gas. It all strapped to the pilot house. Everything was carried on the stern part. Uh, goats once or twice or a cow or something like that cattle everything you could anything you'd want including animals would go down on the bessie virginia uh daddy one time helped him load a house trailer on the bessie virginia and they seesawed all the way across family coast sound and it was amazing that they could get through the railroad bridge here because they loaded daddy had a jeep 1949 jeep so this was right after 1949 van henry uh, asked Daddy if he'd help him back this Jeep onto his boat. So they had a couple of planks for back the back the Jeep, back the house trailer on the on the Bessie, Virginia. And they back and, and uh, Powers had to sit on the hood of the the Jeep to keep from picking the front wheels off the ground. It, it was a pretty heavy load they backed on, <laughs> and it rocked as soon as they and it, you know I said it lifted the Jeep right off the ground when they finally got it on the on the boat. So that I know that the bridge, well, the bridge had a horizontal clearance, I looked that up, of 69 feet. So the trailer could not have been any wider than 69 feet, probably just a little bit less. But it hung way out on both sides. Which they, bridge? The railroad, Norfolk Southern Railroad Bridge. Oh. Right. It was here just below where they loaded. So the boat would go under that? No, it, it was a swing span. Oh, okay. No, okay. You know, but it had a horizontal clearance of 69 feet. So okay, of course. You couldn't change that. You could, you yeah. know, the bridge would open, you'd go through. Okay. But nothing wider than 69 feet would go through that bridge. <laughs> so, anyway, so it was, and then, and Van Henry would, while they were in town, Van Henry would go around and visit all the merchants and collect the orders, and people would make deliveries down there. And Do you remember him? Like, yeah. What was he like? He was. He was like family almost. He'd go. We'd, he'd eat with us, and up when he was here. And he'd you know good old okra coke, or he'd talk like you know all the rest of them down there. And you know, get that good old brogue, and I used to enjoy listening to him. Yeah. And 
he would tell us uh, some stories. Uh, I know one time Van Henry told a story. I'm getting off what was he like thing, but Sorry. he would. Uh, he said one time in the Navy, he was there was a fellow, I think, from Ohio in the Navy. He was trying to teach all these sailors how to land properly, dock a landing craft, LCMs or LCVPs, or landing craft. And it was probably an LCM at the time, Mike boat, they call them. And big old steel had two uh, gray diesels in it, Detroit. Anyway, uh, and so the man would, the, the uh, coxswain on the Navy was teaching Van Henry, who was maybe just a seaman at the time, how to dock a boat. Van Henry grew up at Ocracoke, and he knew how to dock a boat very well, better than this other fellow. And the man said, oh, you know, just go up to the dock kind of easy and, you know, put it in reverse and, you know, back up and do all this other stuff. Van Henry did it the way he always did it, he said. And he just roared right wide open right towards the dock. And all of a sudden, cut the engine and cut the wheel at the same time. And the last thing he remembers hearing the fellow from screaming just about, you know, he thought he was going to kill them all. And the boat just swung right around and stopped right up next to the pier perfectly. Wow. Van Henry passed, of course. <laughs> it didn't do it the Navy way, but. <laughs> but uh, That's great. He. <laughs> That's great. But he enjoyed telling about you know, his way or the Navy way, and his way won every time because he was good at it. So do you know how many years he ran that route, the freight yeah. boat route? Yep, he ran it. He bought it in, I said, 1949 or 1950, and he operated until, I had it written down somewhere, but maybe there, but he operated until 1950. Something like about uh, in the sixties, he finally. Mm. I've got it down here anyway. He, um, well, it makes sense. He operated till it, all the the ferries going in and all the when they built the roads at Ocracoke and all the way down the Outer Banks, all the truck industry that that did away with his business really yeah because so they built the Oregon out. Inlet Bridge in what 63 maybe 64 or and, so and I they think. started paving the roads yeah. and then the state started getting into the ferry business and it yeah. was state run ferries mm -hmm. so state run ferries and then of course that was uh and some of the the wooden ferries they moved down to they were purchased privately and the fella ran it I'm trying to think on Ocracoke Inlet, who was it operated that ferry? Uh, anyway, it was privately run at Ocracoke for a while. He, he bought one of the steel, the steel or the wooden ferries from the state, mm -hmm. and ran it until he just about sunk it. it was from Hatteras to Ocracoke. Hatteras to Ocracoke. Uh -huh. I, I know the name. The name? I, I, I know the name of the man, and I can't think of it right now. But Van Henry would, and they'd bring up, when he came back up this way, he brought seafood, crabs. A lot of that, brought a lot of crabs. And one summer, the uh, market was flooded with crabs. Had a big crab year, and nobody, there was no market. And Van Henry's crabs, he had a whole hole full of crabs on the best of Virginia, and he couldn't get rid of them. And they were starting to go bad fast in there, and it was making a big smell. So Van Henry asked Dad if he wouldn't mind taking some crabs free did then and so daddy loaded up had a pickup truck and loaded all had a truck load of crabs and he thought he was doing mother a favor by fertilizing all the flowers all the plants in our yard with dead crabs so i think mother was gone at the time and she, i think mother came home and they were crying i remember that and he sprinkled crabs around every plant there was in the yard and i don't think the neighbors appreciated it any more than mother did because it was uh, Pretty powerful smell over there. So, anyway, I think the next day the crabs mysteriously disappeared, and that was the end of the story. Nobody ever mentioned crabs anymore. That was they were crabs are gone in this. But yeah, there's a lot of. So when you were a boy, you actually rode from here on the Bessie Virginia to Ocracoke. Yep, and back. Do you remember how long it would take? Yeah, it was seven or so hours. And going over there, and Van Henry told me there was one trip that he made um, 
I can't remember what year it was, but he carried you know, passengers and freight. Average trip was seven hours and 15 minutes, but he made with a good tide, she made it across in six hours and 55 minutes. And Van Henry was really proud of that. <laughs> oh yeah, service, September 1961 was the last uh, uh, trip she made. Wow. And his son, Ronnie Van O'Neill, who lives on Ocracoke, I don't know whether you've met him or not. Yes, I have actually. Have you? Well, Ronnie Van, Ronnie and I talk every once in a while, and I don't even remember, it's been so long since I've seen him. And Ronnie Van's sister, Christine, both, and Ronnie Van said he went with his dad to Norfolk. They took it to Bessie, Virginia to sell it, took it to Norfolk. And Ronnie Van made that last trip with his daddy on the Bessie, Virginia. Oh. So. Huh, so she was uh, sold up to Virginia way. Mm -hmm. Virginia. And then my father and mother in the 1970s, I think it was sometime, went to went to the Bahamas down that way. And at Hybern Key, he, he heard there was one boat that they had to take a rough freight boat down there. And the name of it was the Bessie Virginia. And Daddy couldn't believe it. He got on it, so he went down there, and there she was. Was it the and same they, boat? Yeah, same vessel. Bessie Virginia had been sold and was operating a similar service to what you know, the Washington Ocracoke run, but it was between the islands in the Keys in the Bahamas. Wow. And the fellow, they, they changed it a little bit. They put another pilot house on top of the one that was existed when she ran here. Well, she had a fine retirement then, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, yeah. So anyway, <laughs> and I don't, it may still be operating, who knows, but, it's, uh, but it did that for a long time. Um, I remember reading that the Bessie Virginia would bring people to, was it the Pamlico Inn for a dance? Do you remember anything about that? <sighs> Or I might be thinking of it, it, I might be thinking of a different boat. There was there were other boats. Vesta Virginia's the last of that one, but then after World War Two, about that time, there was a another boat. There was a and that you might have seen write ups on that. Uh there was a Captain Willis, I think it was. Glenn Willis of Beaufort operated another vessel here. And it was a air speed rescue boat or something like that. It was a high speed run to from here to Ocracoke, and uh. you get them down there fast. But the man, and while he was docked about a block from where we are, about at the foot of Bonner Street here in Washington, uh, he'd gone somewhere, and the first mate shot him, killed him. And so that ended that one. Oh my gosh, what was so, the dispute over? I don't, he was mad at him over pay or something like that. He was, and the fellow, the first mate had a few drinks, and. Was waiting for him on the boat when he came back around midnight, I think, 11, 12 o'clock. Do you remember the name of that boat? Yeah. Chance? I got <laughs> I got a lot of things written down that I can't <laughs> remember to tell you about. Glenn Willis, the name of the vessel, it was the Lindsay C. Warren. The Lindsay was the name of it. Warren, huh? And it ran between Washington and Ocracoke. And then for a very short while, and I don't know whether that's written down here or not, uh, Kim Saunders, was a, and I knew him too, he ran just for maybe a few months or six months or something like that. And he had another uh, air sea rescue boat named the Maupaw. And when he bought it again, it, I think, I don't know what kind of engines it had, but it's like a PT boat. You could watch a fuel level go down when they were running. It ate up so much gas. So he had to take that engine out. It was a high-speed gasoline engine. Ah. His rescue vessel, and yeah. he replaced it with diesels, which huh. slowed it down a lot, but he could afford the fuel. Yeah. Was was Washington <laughs> a larger port? Like, how did Washington yeah. compare to New Bern as a, as a port? Bigger, I think, than New Bern. Wow. This was real early in New Bern. Uh, Washington, uh, I think the highway went between, you know, Baltimore, you know, there's eastern cities and it went through as you probably know again uh you know bath that come edenton bath and then there was a long ferry crossing at bath to get to newburn and they changed the uh, the highway to washington you know to avoid that long ferry crossing and it, because the road you know the river's narrow here and ah. sent from so it went from edenton to washington highway 17 basically and then on to Newburn and South. Oh. And this, like other cities too, this was as far as you could get on a sailing vessel. So it transferred to those scows that they originally they'd pole up the river from here to Tarboro and Greenville, Tarboro cities up that way. And uh, 
then they were replaced by steam vessels. And what have I left out? What is a scow? What's a scow? Hey, just a barge? A, yeah, just old flat bottom barge. It was pulled by slaves or later on people that were hired to do that sort of thing. Is that what the James Adams Floating Theater was originally, a scow? Too big for that. Oh, so can, you, was, are, can we turn our attention to the James Adams and tell me about that boat? Uh, and then, really again, can't. way before your time, but... It was way before my time, and all I remember was my dad talking about the James Adams flooding, you know, about attending the launch of it. And it was launched at um, the Pharaoh Shipyard. Again, you may have researched all this stuff. No, but I anyway, don't remember the Pharaoh Shipyard. Here it is. I'm going to stand and show you this. Sure. But Sanborn maps. I keep asking. You're probably familiar with a lot of these things. Yeah. Anyway, Sanborn Fire Insurance Company. Oh, yeah. That's where they came from. And you can, at UNC Chapel, at Wilson Library's got that collection. They've oh, got it here, the whole that's thing. cool. But here is, and this is just one of the maps. I mean, there's just a whole collection of maps on lots of towns. Uh-huh. Sanborn map shows at 1885 as uh, the Pharaoh Shipyard, which was half a block from where we are right now. Uh -huh. 1885, then 1911, uh, for instance, it was still there. It changed the shoreline contour mm -hmm. changed a little mm -hmm. bit. And in uh -huh. 1924, the railway was still there, but it had bought by. Uh, I think I can't remember. Anyway, I can't even read it now, but it's bought by someone else. Right. But that was the, the shipyard. We are on South Market Street. We're right in here now. Uh-huh. Okay. So it's right around the corner. Uh, right went down yeah. just to, you know, about half a block beyond right, that. Estuary right. was over here now. But we were, of course, you can't tell where here now is on an audio tape. That doesn't do you yeah. do the tape a bit of good. <laughs> we're right here, which was on the... Uh, between Water Street and the river, between Bonner and Market Street on the south side of Water Street, right, where, right. where the shipyard was. And there were yeah. a number of houses over there and that lined the street, as were uh, old days, there were lots of uh, taverns down here and uh, two distilleries. Okay, so, so tell me what your father told you about the James Adams Floating Theater? Other than he remembers seeing it launched, I can't tell you, really can't tell you much about that. I wish I could. But it wasn't built as a theater. It was something, it was like it a... It was something else. It was a lumber barge or something. It was something else, and I don't remember that part of the history. I just remember it was a large vessel, which when it was launched, it was an event. So what place. did he say about that? Did everybody go down his, there? His, yeah, a lot of people went down, which is the only reason he remembers it, just because it was something noteworthy, and a lot of people went down to attend the launching of it. So I really can't I don't know anymore. Did he ever go on the boat? Did he ever see a mm -hmm. show? No, I mean, he was so young. He wasn't but three years old at the time oh. she was launched, and so it was... Yeah. Daddy was born in 1910, so that would kind of yeah. limit that. Well, that's and good, yeah. Ocracoke, I'm going to get back to Ocracoke. Sure. I, you know, thoughts of, uh, you know, the connection was more than just commercial. It bonded everybody together between Ocracoke and Washington, and like Englehart is into Harris. The families knew each other, and they depended on each other. It was necessity. Uh, and there were a whole lot of residents in Washington would have houses at Ocracoke. I think of the Nunley Cottage and the Taylor Cottage and Rhodes Taylor Gallagher. There's a Gallagher house down there too. And he was a a great cousin or something. He was a relative of mine. I, I think I'm kin to everybody. But anyway, <laughs> Rhodes Taylor Gallagher was a dentist in Washington. This was 1920s, 30s. And when he'd go to Ocracoke, he'd take his treadle-powered drill and all his dental equipment down there and work on everybody at Ocracoke while he was down on vacation. He'd go to Ocracoke and spend a couple of weeks. And I know that had to be a painful 
tooth filling job. Yeah, you, know, you pump it's like an old sewing machine, a treadle powered thing. Oh, I cannot even imagine. But he'd drill it out and he'd fill teeth and pull teeth and do whatever <laughs> dental care was necessary, whatever he's capable of doing. Yeah. And they all saved their dental work for him because they knew he'd be there, and so he did right. did a whole lot of that. But it bound everybody together. You know, we all and we people in white. There's not that connection anymore. It's gone. You know, because they have. You know, they're more independent than they used to be. Yeah. And you don't have that social connection that once existed between here and there. Yeah. Yeah. And that was that was a powerful bond between the families. Absolutely, and I'm sure so. there was some. Um, you know, marriage, swapping going, I mean, you know yeah. what I mean? People would find spouses yeah. on the mainland or on Ocracoke. Mm -hmm. I didn't mean to <laughs> most, say marriage swap. Most spouses are Ocracoke, two <laughs> Ocracoke spouses, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there were. <laughs> but that's so interesting that your family had that No, I haven't seen anybody with six toes yet, right? But anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh. So do you, do you think the big picture was changes in, in infrastructure and transportation really led to, you know, a kind of diminishment of those relationships? Yeah. Yeah. It did. It did. Yeah. Wow. Well, so this has been fascinating, Blunt. And I've got, I, I am trying to, just like you all do, and I am trying to write all I can. Good. Put together, and I've got lots more. I've got my parents uh, and relatives. I've got audio tapes, which I have, and I've still got some others that are being in process right now, being converted to digital stuff because I'm about to lose my audio tapes. Yeah, good for so you. There's a place in Greenville that's uh, doing some conversion to digital. Well, all right. So before mm -hmm. we talk about that, um, well, I'll, I'll turn this off when we talk mm -hmm. about that. But is there anything else you wanted to add? Any other stories or thoughts about this whole importance? Well, I have of lots of stories and thoughts, but I can't recall it all right now. It's just, <laughs> That's okay. it's, it's, oh, here's another one. Um, I'm looking at notes because I didn't want to forget some of the things. Uh, in the late 1940s, my father's auto parts store was at 189 West Main Street, downtown Washington, as everything else was downtown, not like spread out the way they are now. And Mr., there was a Mr. Rob Fowle, who was the last member of that generation of Fowle families that had the sailing vessels. Uh, and he had a store on Main Street, and he was retired, had long since passed retirement age, but he just kept his store open for something to do. And our auto parts store was next door, and I remember going over there, and Mr. Rob would have it. There was a 55-gallon, it was a steel, a steel drum at the time. I think it originally might have been wooden barrels, but it was a steel 55-gallon drum full of molasses he had just inside his front door. And he had an old hand crank pump and a number of mason jars, and you'd go get molasses from him. I remember those. And he'd pump whatever amount of molasses you needed, sell that by the jar. And huh. before that, when they'd unload the vessels, Daddy said they would, they'd roll them off of some of these ships that came from Barbados or wherever with, you know, with things. And, and every once in a while, these wooden barrels would crack, and they'd, they'd, they'd bump it over on the side, and they'd roll it down, and it was a little rough treatment probably. And, and they'd start leaking molasses on the pavement, or the ground, I guess it wasn't, no pavement much. And all the little boys, the black ones and white ones, didn't race and made no difference. You know, they were all down there, and that was like candy. They'd go down and scoop up molasses with their hands and eat it. <laughs> and it was it was a big treat because they'd all hang around waiting for a barrel of molasses to break open. They were hopefully so something would break open. Washington had access to all these exotic goods from yeah. the West Indies. Yeah, it came from Barbados. And Washington, probably like a lot of other towns, um, all the round rocks you find in town, foundations for houses and walls and things like that, every last one of them a ballast rock. There are no naturally occurring rock in town. Like yep. those right like there. Those. Town's full of them. A lot of them still underwater where they unloaded things. And I, I know where a few of them are, but I haven't told a lot of people, but anyway. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything that is rounded rock that size, you know, that five pound, 10 pound, 50-pound rocks, some of them were so heavy that most of them were 
a smaller size that was manageable for somebody to pick them up. But right. They'd, they'd come in uh, lightly loaded most of the time, things from the West Indies. Yeah. And leave here with a lot of heavier things, lumber, you know, naval stores, tar pits, turpentine, those things. And it weighed a lot more than what they brought in. So they'd unload all the ballast. They'd cast out all the, you know, all those. Huh. And they would they'd become foundations for houses and wharves and those things. So yeah. you can still see that walking around today, can't you? A lot of, you know, older, yeah. older places, yeah. Lots of foundations rock like that. And they had turpentine stills, a lot of them across the river. They uh, boil that. That was a pine sap. Yeah. So they had s several turpentine stills close to downtown Washington, and uh, ships would load a lot of that. They just pull up to where the stills were. The stills weren't in white, right in town because if they caught on fire, they'd take out the whole town. They didn't want them in town. Oh, okay. So they, just like the, the old detached kitchens on houses, there's a reason, fire. So they, and smoke and that kind of thing. So they, when you walk down to the waterfront, there's a little island right there. Is that the island yeah, in the picture right there, the, the painting? That's the picture on a castle island. Uh -huh. And there are two other, it's, it's like an elongated island now. Okay. But there were, there were two other islands just below that it was, show water between Castle Island and the Norfolk Southern Railroad Bridge. And the last time this dredge, this river was dredged was in 1938 by a Corps of Engineers dredge, steam dredge named the Henry Bacon. Ah. And it was a 36 inch hydraulic dredge, pipeline dredge. And when it was doing the river here, uh, it, the spoil area, it created two other islands between the original Castle Island and the railroad bridge. Okay. And it was just spoil area and it seeded itself and recent hurricanes have connected all of them, you know, the wash between, you know, the flow going down right. the river. Huh. And so they're all grown up, looks like one long island now almost. But, yeah, what is the little industry but, in that painting on that island? Okay, it has been everything. It has been a, a old Civil War fort. There was a, a lumber mill there at one time. Uh -huh. Uh, the last thing that was there was a turpentine steel. No, excuse me, not turpentine steel. It was a, a kill for baking oyster shells. Oh. Lime, agricultural use. Oh, interesting. So the oyster shells were down there, of course. And uh, whenever you had you know, something that created a lot of heat, you didn't want it downtown. You didn't want the fire getting away from them. So yeah. there have been too many of those that burned up town two or three times. Right. So when they had a choice, they located anything like that that created high heat and flame yeah. hazard huh. away from town. Because uh, farming is has long been a big industry yeah. around here, yeah. so they needed that lime. Yeah. Yeah. So they they bake oyster shells and do that. And the, probably the last industry was a lady had a her own little enterprise down there and invited gentlemen down to the island. And, <laughs> You won't find anything written down. I do know her name, but I will not tell you what it is. Did she have a name <laughs> for her business? <laughs> no, but she was well known. She didn't need a name for it. You won't find the first thing. No, no printed material showing. Yeah. You know, what, no. what what decades did that go on? This was she died in the nineteen forties. She came from Chesapeake Bay, married a fisherman, commercial fisherman, lived down here. And, uh, so she operated her enterprise from 1920s, 30s, something like that. You and, must have heard about that. Oh, yeah, everybody's heard about it. And a lot of people <laughs> don't think there really was such a person, but there was. I, I kind of know. I'm not telling. It's yeah. kind of like the Lost Colony. You don't want to reveal, you know, things that might make it less mysterious, you know, so you don't want to say, oh, I know where the lost colony was. A lot of people found evidence of that. And so I think I know the lady's name and her husband and some children, and I saw a birth certificate one time that had uh, where a child was born, and the official place of birth was Washington, but above the printed word Washington on the birth certificate, the doctor had written Castle. So I believe that Child must have been born on Castle Island. Huh. 
That was Castle Island. And that was Castle Island. So are there still family members around? Yes. That's yes. why another reason I'm not telling you what yeah. that person's name was. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. <laughs> no, we don't want to. We're going to keep it mysterious. <laughs> <laughs> but if on my deathbed, I'll reveal it to somebody else. <laughs> Wow, so but, there was just a lot of enterprising and Yeah, a lot of enterprising. Ventures. So that, that was one of the last ones there. <laughs> <laughs> that island. Well, Blunt, this has been fascinating. So um, I think we've we've been talking for about an hour. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think I'll draw this to a close. All right. But yeah. um, I really appreciate your taking right. the time okay. to talk to me about well, this. It's just been delightful. Okay. <laughs>